so I'm studying here in Taipei, Taipei at uh, NTNU or Shifan Dashu or we just say Shida. Um and today I'm the lovely Da'an Sunlin Gong Yuan, which is just the famous Da'an Park in Taiwan. Um, it's actually not too far from where I live, so came to film here. And yeah, I want to share with you guys today about the differences between studying Chinese in China versus Taiwan. So I'm gonna break down the differences into a few categories. And those categories are scholarship funding, um, housing and then I have class broken up into different sections so I'm going to be talking about class um, schedule or class time uh, class attendance class environment Chinese textbooks um, and then grades and then from there I'll be talking about other things like student environment uh, student resources and extracurriculars so that's a lot that is a lot to cover. So how I'm going to break this down is that I'm going to um, put the flags up respectively when I'm talking about a certain country. So when I talk about China and then when I talk about Taiwan, it's going here. So yeah, let's get started. So let's start with scholarship funding. So um, if you apply for the scholarship, they provide, they pay for tuition and room and board up front. So meaning if you get the scholarship, all of that's paid for. And then on top of that, they give you a stipend of 3,000 RMB, um, which is around like 413 US dollars. And then, um, and that's given once a month. Um, so that's really nice. You don't have to, mm, some schools you may have to book the, for the dorm in advance. But at Fudan, they did all that for us. You just show up, you check your name, and bam. And you have to make sure you bring all your the documents they send through the Chinese um, embassy in your home country. Um, if you actually want to learn how to apply for this program, I have a blog post on that. So check that out in my description box. In terms of China, is it enough? Is the money enough in China? I would say if you're not, if you're eating locally, like the schools generally have canteens and you can spend like 10 RMB which is like I don't know maybe like two US dollars per meal you can you can live off the 3,000 that they give but if you want to do anything actually like go out and party um, travel forget it <laughs> okay and then now in terms of Taiwan um, the scholarship, um, even though if you get it, they do not provide housing, um, so you have to find that on your own. And I'll talk about that more in the housing aspect. Um, and then also, um, this scholarship is kind of different because they give a stipend of 25,000 NT, not US dollars. Um, and that translates to a little over 800 US dollars. And that's given on a monthly basis. But just like China, they, um, they give you a, um, you have to wait a month to get the money. Um, and, but then when you wait a month, they only give you the tw one set of 25,000. Um, so they recommend people to bring at least 2,500 US dollars because you have to pay for a lot of things up front. You need to pay for the tuition up front and find your own housing and put deposits on that. And those two things alone are pretty expensive. Another thing that's different about the Taiwan Hua Yu scholarship is that even though the stipend is more, they expect students to pay for the tuition, um, your housing, and then the rest of your expenses with that money. So I'll give you an example. I go to um, NTNU, MTC. Um, their language program, it depends which one you choose, but I'm in the regular class. That one costs um, 26400 per semester. I receive 25000 times that by three that's 75,000 
but really the tuitions do every like every two and a half months so having to split your money to pay for that also my housing which is like at least eight thousand five hundred it varies from month to month and then the rest for food is it enough I'm gonna say no <laughs> um, it's to be realistic if you if I'm there probably are students that are on the scholarship that are living solely off this money but to be honest it's not enough you're really cutting it you know Taiwan is a little bit more expensive than China to live by but it's still relatively cheap compared to any Western country you would travel to. Now the next category is housing. So like I said in China, um, you get to stay on um, the school's dorm and it's normally the international dorm and it's much better than the Chinese dorms. Um, generally, I have a video actually, I'll put it somewhere here. Um, of me, my tour of my dorm at, in China at Fudan University. Check that out. So generally you have either maybe a room to yourself um, and then share like the bathroom and the living room and stuff with other friends, other people. Um, or um, maybe you have uh, one roommate. It, it really varies from school to school. So I will tell you at Fudan, um, all the scholarship students live on the um, all of the scholarship students live in the international student dorm which is actually blocked off from the rest of the other dorms um, by a gate and then in the actual rooms we lived in the sub buildings all scholarship students or majority of them lived in the sub buildings and we there's four people in that but it's more like a suite ish style type I don't know would you no I wouldn't I wouldn't consider it a suite but each person had their own room and then you just shared there were two bathrooms which is really nice and then a l kitchen living I guess you would say kitchen area um, it was pretty nice it was small but honestly I was only there for years so it was all I needed and then we also had a balcony and I love that balcony um, you get to look out and see the beautiful scenery um, and in terms of Taiwan like I said there is no housing um, for scholarship students you cannot live on the dorm campus dormitory because most a lot of schools don't have the space for it um, and some I think even maybe they most of the schools don't even um, provide dormitory for um, scholarship students so if unless you're like a degree student if you're a degree student you can stay on campus and it's much much cheaper but yeah actually I only met one person who's also under the um, Hwayu Richmond scholarship that's staying in the dorm but he goes to a school in Tainan he said it's a really small school and only like there are only like five international students in that whole school so I think he has a very special case but ev from apart from everyone else I've heard you cannot stay on campus so have to find um, an apartment for some people that may be something new for them so it's it's not really difficult there's websites like Facebook and TLIT there's a lot of groups where people advertise um, their housing it's really really convenient I found my place through there um, in terms of finding housing I think I looked at five places and I ended up choosing the one in a really good location near Taipei 101 um, it has I live right by night market so it's like so convenient to eat eat food and then the price is good I only pay 8,500 NT plus um, how much I ever use for electricity which is never no more than a hundred NT so and if you think about it compared to the West this is really cheap for housing but for Taiwan I want to think more in Taipei and Taiwan standards this is pretty okay this is average this is pretty average I would say if you're on scholarship and you're limited on funds I would say try to not find, try to put, find places that are no more than 10,000 because anything after that I mean if it's worth it yeah go ahead but like yeah you're just you're gonna be really short on money um, 
I would also recommend if you're finding looking for housing, you could find before you come. I personally, I want to see the places up front before I book. Some of the people I've met booked before they came and then they just moved in. And that works for them, I guess. But like, um, I personally recommend come at least two weeks before so you could get acclimated to the environment. I would say this both for China and Taiwan. Um, and then um, when you find, go to actual place, see how it is before you decide. Go to multiple places. And then if, if plus, if you have a Taiwanese friend, go with them because maybe there is a language barrier. But actually a lot of the places that people rent out to, particularly on the two websites I mentioned, TLIT and Facebook groups, they all speak pretty good English, so I wouldn't be too concerned about that, but yeah. Okay, next we're going to talk about class um, schedule, class time. So in terms of China, in terms of the class time there, so um, actually I forgot to mention this, but if you apply for the scholarship, um, you can choose as short as one semester, which is about four, almost four-ish months, almost five? I can't, yeah almost five months um and you can choose as short as that you could do a year and you can also do two years or even a year and a half um so there's that and normally semester fall semester is normally where most people come so it normally starts in september through january and then spring semester is from march till Ju almost july or no june yeah yeah, June. So um, keep that in mind, depending on your school schedules. And then in terms of the class schedule, so how it looks like every week. So in China, normally you take up to 20 hours of class per week. But actually for me, because I started in um, the very beginner level, A, at Fudan, I only had 15 hours of class, uh, Monday through Friday. You cannot choose your schedule. They just kind of put you in whatever. And class can be as early as 8 a.m. to as late as 4 p.m. But it varies every day. It's not like, oh, um, we start every day at the same time and at the same time. Although I heard like my friends at BLC, that went to BLCU, they started and ended at the same time every day. So it really depends from school to school. Um, and then um, normally they take attendance within the first 20 minutes. So if you don't, come within the first 20 minutes they're just gonna mark you absent if you come late teachers are gonna still mark you absent so make sure you get the class on time and then also um, in terms of scholarship requirements requirements and I'll get into why I put that in quotations um, you cannot miss more than was it 12 or 15 percent of classes I can't remember I don't remember honestly it's, that that happened so long ago but yeah, you can't miss no more than that. Otherwise, um, they won't give you the scholarship stipend for the next month. But I put that in quotations because we found that not to be true. I met a lot of people on that scholarship and they missed so much class, more than the required, and <laughs> they still got their money. So, yeah. But I would say don't quote me on that schools some maybe some other schools are more strict about it i have a friend that goes to Sichuan university in chengdu and she told me they're a little bit more strict there and then another thing to know if you're on scholarship it varies from school to school but like at fudan we had to turn in like a survey form that you could download from their website and email it before like the 20th of each month um, but once again um that we found that not to be so much true. I had a friend that didn't send them in. And then actually in March, I believe, they e sent a mass email saying, oh, we noticed some people haven't turned in the, the um, surveys. Uh, please do so, otherwise you really won't get the money. So my friend had to come up with <laughs> some answers. It's kind of funny. But yeah, it was, it's they're, they're it's pretty like they have all these rules but it's pretty um they're pretty soybean with it it's just kind of like they enforce it sometimes and sometimes you don't so <laughs> but like i said don't quote me on that <laughs>
In terms of breaks with China, they're, they're, they give some really long and generous breaks. Um, the biggest ones for Mid Autumn Festival, um, they call it Golden Week. It's always the first week of October. Yeah, first week of October. Um, you have a whole week off, so that's really nice. I traveled a little bit and I also went to a music festival all in that week. It was really nice. And then for winter break, they give off almost two months, so travel to Sichuan and um, Southeast Asia during those times. And then also during the summer, if you plan to come back in the fall, they also give another two months. And then what's really nice about the, that time off, they give the stipend during those times as well. I think we got 5,000 RMB instead of 3,000, I believe. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. It was really nice. So, a lot of students, they stay. No, most students, they go back home. For me, home is was too far, too expensive, and not worth my time. So I traveled, and then some, a lot of people travel, and then a few people, they just stay and on campus and do whatever. Or I don't know what they do, actually. I had a few friends that stayed, but they didn't do much, so... Um, and then in Taiwan, in terms of class attendance in Taiwan, um, actually they're really, they're much, much stricter here. So give you an um, idea of the schedule. So um, you can, when you apply for the scholarship, you can uh, apply to do either two months, which in the summer, either from June to July, July to August, um, three months, six months, or one year. Um, you can specify in your uh, your application what what length you want, but the embassy will it will depend on the embassy what they want to give you. Um, they gave me originally three months, but I negotiated and they gave me nine. And I think it was mainly because someone withdrew. So. <laughs> but yeah, I would say look into that. Think about how long you want to go for. This is really good for people if they don't want to commit for a long time. I think Taiwan is better for that because um, for China it's much longer I mean if you withdraw they don't really penalize you so it's okay but yeah um, I'm here for nine months I did my first three months so semesters every three months and then in between the three months you have a break um, of one week um, we don't get as a lot of breaks so it kind of sucks but it's okay. I guess you learn more Chinese that way. <laughs> um, and then in terms of class time, we have, um, every school is different um, and it depends, but like at Shuda, because I'm taking regular classes, um, we only have max 10 hours of class per week. So two hours of class a day, which is really short. Um, it almost feels too short, but then because the scholarship and the visa requirement requires at least 15 hours a week, we have to take additional courses, and that varies. Or, or we, there's like big lecture hall classes um, of interesting topics, and then there's also, you could also just go to the library or the computer lab for study hours, so. And that's pretty easy to obtain. You just gotta make sure you do it consistently. and. The, the school counts it by a month month basis so make sure you do it within the scheduled time and actually every month the hours that they require in each room or each the, of the class types differ so yeah it's not too difficult to obtain um, but yeah it's it's pretty straightforward very straightforward okay let's talk about the class environment now so let's start with China um, ooh, dog, cute dog I wish I could show you but in China so how it is we have five different classes there's reading writing listening speaking and then a grammar course um, and they're split out amongst the five days I think I can't remember which course we had the most often I'm just gonna post my old schedule here just so you can see how it looked like um, and label it Writing we had the least, it was always on a Friday, and honestly, 
I skipped that class so much like it was so bad <laughs> um, but yeah it was it was we stay in the same class um, our class size range from 15 to 20 students um, and we stay in the same classroom the teacher comes in for each period or whatever we get what's nice we get um, 10 minute breaks between each hour so that was really nice and then if from 11 30, 35 to 12 35 there was lunch so one hour for lunch I normally eat in the canteen or if I'm feeling a little adventurous I'll go home and eat something which that was rare or I would go eat in a nearby restaurant that was super cheap so that was nice um, and then also for the classes itself um, different teachers and my teachers honestly my language learning at Fudan wasn't that great I would say just because the teachers most of them did have very little experience teaching foreign students some of them didn't even major in like education related majors in their college time and then also um, I don't know they, they just weren't good the technique wasn't good it was very like after the first two months of learning the same exact style every week it was like okay I'm bored with this like I'm not interested and I actually would skip class because of it it's sad but it's the truth in fact but yeah it just wasn't that great I felt like especially and I'll get to the next section soon the freaking textbooks were part of the reason why but also the teachers style of teaching it it felt like they were teaching Chinese students but really we're international students so the styles it just needs to change up it, it was so like I don't know it was a decent base but like it could be, it could have been so much better now I may be wrong maybe my experience may be different for other people so I would say go out branch out and do more outside the classroom um, but also another thing to note about that um, it's hard meeting Chinese people um, like and becoming friends like I met some but like you know the culture there is very different so it's hard to open up and meet people there I would say in general and I'm not <laughs> I'm gonna be honest if you're not white they don't have most of them may not have any interest in you. I'm just I'm just being real just being real but we're not gonna talk about that today um, but yeah so yeah it's it's difficult it's, it's very difficult and you like I would say to this too don't make the class experience determine how you're gonna learn a language you can branch out and learn outside the classroom but like in Shanghai I swear every Chinese person from every inch of that country lived there. Everyone had very different accents. I could not understand people half of the time. Honestly, like I would talk to people. I'm like, did I hear it wrong? Am I stupid? Like, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Um, and actually, because Fudan's not in the center, you don't people say oh Shanghai Beijing those aren't real Chinese cities yeah I get that but you still try it's still a language barrier a lot of people still can't speak English so yeah if you're not in a restaurant ordering food they cannot speak English so don't vouch that they will in terms of Taiwan oh my god I love the class environment in Taiwan so um, how it works is in Taiwan there's only one class one teacher but you do everything in that class you do you work on the grammar the vocabulary the listening speaking writing um, and what's nice and I think this once again varies from school to school but at NTNU we are we're in like we're a class of max 10 people so, and it looks more like a mini conference room so it's one big table square table we sit around the table the teachers in front there's a powerpoint and um, when we participate in class 
she goes around she does not really call on people so you have to participate oh and that's one thing about china i didn't do so much I didn't participate in class my teachers were um not they some of them had favorites so i wasn't very fond of that but on to let's not talk about that but yeah in taiwan don't you have to participate um my teacher makes sure that you understand the material or at least get it at to some level um and it just makes learning chinese much fun, much more fun much better um and also my teacher is so nice the way she teaches it it's like it's very very i feel like the teachers at ntnu are very like highly qualified they know what they're talking about if we don't understand a grammar point she will break it down for us and i'm like wow this is amazing and then the best thing about it she also like you know we have a textbook but she she um expands on that i remember we learned about um being sick one day and then she gave us a sheet of paper with a human body and labeled every part of the human body both in English and Chinese like I never got something like that in China I'm so serious <laughs> but yeah it was just perfect it was so good so so good um, yeah and we always plays oh, we always play different games in class like um, when we we're about to take a test She'll pull out some flashcards, flip them over, scramble them out on the table, and see if we can match the pinion with the, char the, the characters. Let me tell you about these textbooks. Now, let's start with China. Let me tell you about that textbook. So bad, so many levels. So many people can vouch me for this. I'm not exaggerating. So here's my problem. So these books we use, they're called integrated. I don't remember what it's called. I'll put a picture here. But it doesn't matter. They have books from 1 to 10. So I started in book 1 and, then, and finished them in, in the beginning of book 4-ish. And these books were horrendous because we would, they would, I feel like the lessons didn't cohesively come together. I felt like I was learning a lot of random topics about things people talk about, but stuff that I wouldn't talk about every day. So a lot of words just aren't practical. I wanna learn words that are, or just stuff that is practical to what I do on an everyday basis if I was talking to someone. So I felt like the book, the books lacked in that. But then also um, a lot of the words Chinese people don't use, so like, the very first or second chapter, I can't remember, of the book one, um, we learned Huli Hutu and Mama Huhu. It's within the first book. And Huli Hutu means confused. And Mama Huhu means, uh, I don't remember what that word means. I'm going to put it here. But either way, like, Chinese people actually don't use that word. So I used it um, to one of my friends. And she was just like, No, she asked me why are you saying that. <laughs> She's like, Chinese people don't use that. I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like, this is not how I wanted to learn Chinese. And um, a lot of the books, English, particularly in the first and second books, just was so incorrect. Some words they would define using a slang word. Oh my God, I wish I had the book so I could show you. I don't remember. I think they use the word trifling and if anyone doesn't know trifling means like disgusting but that normally refers to a person or maybe a place or a thing but yeah they use that I'm pretty sure or something and I was like laughing for five minutes straight because I was like even people that learn English as a second language wouldn't know that word like <laughs> why would you use this word I'm pretty sure whoever wrote these books just open google translate and translate it from chinese 
to English. That's how bad it was. And then after the first book, I'm pretty sure all the grammar points were written in Chinese. And honestly, I need to learn way more Chinese before you can start doing that to me, honestly. Oh, I was so like shocked. Or like, and, and then some of the English to Chinese translations just were bad, even for the dialogues we would read in the book. So normally there would be vocabulary, a dialogue, and then the grammar, and then were there practice? I think there were, and then I think there were practice questions or whatever. But yeah, it wasn't good at all. We complained about those books so much, and then I really felt bad for my friends in the higher levels because they felt like it was a waste of time as well. For me, I think, I think. Let me put it this way: I think if you go to China, I think China's good. For people who just are learning Chinese because when you get up into the higher levels the classes don't provide that much substance from what I've heard in general so yeah I wouldn't or maybe I would just wouldn't recommend Fudan or any of the schools in Shanghai because this is what I've heard from people I've met so yeah and then in Taiwan Actually, my school create the um, books. It's called A Course in Contemporary Chinese. Um, they have books one through six. These books are pretty thick. Um, and actually, um, at my school, we start in the books depending on where they think we fall. So like, I started in book one, but because I learned Chinese, I started towards the end of the book. Um, and actually, another thing to know, if people don't know already, in Taiwan, they use traditional characters. So you learn have to, have to learn traditional characters. And for someone coming from simplified to traditional, it's not easy. <laughs> Some of the characters you can notice off the bat. Many other, many others, not so much. So be ready for that even after three months I'm become more comfortable but I'm really not there yet in terms of writing it's not there but the books itself they're really good and let me tell you why these books are so good I feel like there's some improvements they can make to it but for the most part they're really good I would say that the book I think follows a more practical approach in terms of how they um, um, introduce lessons and they connect all these lessons to things in real life Taiwan you can practice or go and try out or practice or things you will learn about so like I'll just give an example the last lesson we did last week was on getting married right um, and in the back of the book well kind of like in China they have the same we have a um, list of vocabulary the dialogues and then we also have the grammar points practice and then but then the best part was in the back of each chapter they had um, more practice but then also they have like um, connecting the what we learned to real life how you can or things you should know like for m getting married in Taiwan if you were to invite to go to like um, not getting married in Taiwan but if you were to invite to get invited to a um, wedding um, they talk about how you, how, what's the gift, type of gifts you can give. Um, they talk about the hong bao, which is the red envelope, how much money you bring to the wedding. Um, stuff like that. It's so, so convenient. Um, and just nice. Like, it's, oh, okay, I didn't know that. That's good to know, keep in mind. Things like that. And then I feel like a lot, they give more vocabulary in this book from, from right from the get-go. So, you learn a lot more, but I feel like a lot of it you, it's really useful towards everyday spoken Chinese. So I really don't have any complaints to it. It's just better. I kind of wish I had it when I first started learning Chinese. Um, in the U.S., we use the integrated books. And like I said, although I didn't really um, study Chinese, but I did buy those books. Those books are really nice, too. But I, it's nice to also be in a class environment and hear hear the lessons from a teacher honey let's talk about those grades so let's start in China in China you have to have higher than a 65 at the end so 
Oh, in terms of like homework and stuff, um, it it varies from class to class. Honestly, my teachers almost never gave us homework. If anything, our homework was study the characters, learn the grammar, practice for the um, dictations in class. So, because we would, I forgot to mention this, we have dictations on writing the ch new ch Chinese characters we learned in class. So, there was that. But honestly, all that stuff didn't matter. Because in China, how it works grading wise, and this goes for if you plan to go there for university as well. All they care about is that final exam at the end of the semester. That, whatever you get on that exam will be the grade for that class. So all this homework, all that, no. They, they don't put that into account. So whatever you get is what your grade will be. So if you happen to get under, was it 65 or 60? I can't remember, someone help me here. I'll write it here. <laughs> but if you get under that, they, they, they can refuse to not give you the stipend for the next month. But as it turns out, like I said, China is very lax when it comes to this stuff. I had friends that actually, I met a guy. He is French and he was studying there under the same scholarship as me for a year and a half. He actually never took the exams. So you can pick up the paper where it shows you the grade you got on the exam um, when you finish the entire program, or no, actually at the end of each semester. And it shows in Chinese, did not take the test, did not take the test, did not take. But they still give it to you, because I mean, I don't think they care. They have money to throw around, so why not? But yeah, um, it doesn't matter. You don't even have to take the exam. But don't, don't tell anyone that. Maybe it's different for every school, but at Fudan, they did not give a f <laughs> They did not care at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I took the exam my first semester. My second semester, I actually left school early because I and went back home to intern. But um, yeah, I um, only... I think I got like a 70 something. It was pretty average, but I passed. Um, and actually, um, we actually take exams two times a semester. So once in the middle and then once at the end. But the one at the end is what really counts. So keep that in mind. A lot of people do go to um, study at the language programs in China on, on, on uh, um, for credit. So. Um, and some schools may translate your grades back to something different. So I would say try to, if you know that's the case, keep make sure you try to keep a high grade in class. Yeah, and, or do well on the exam. So, because I had some friends that it affected them when they went back to their home university. So keep that in mind. Now in Taiwan, Taiwan is much, much more strict. So in order to keep your scholarship in Taiwan, you need to have at least 80 or and higher. And um, if you don't, they can not give you the scholarship. So just try to keep that. I had a friend that actually didn't um, get the scholarship for one, to one month. day a month I mean um, you skip more than 12 they won't give it to you so keep that in mind keeping your grade and also keeping your scholarship up. now if you this happens two times then they will take the scholarship away and you have to leave they'll cancel your visa and you have to leave Taiwan so and I honestly I haven't heard this happening to anyone so but maybe I haven't met anyone that has or they wouldn't admit I don't know but yeah just keep that in mind just keep that in mind as you go about studying here and then also what's nice too the grade grading wise actually everything is counted if you do dictations if you do presentation if you turn in your completed homework all of that counts towards your final grade so um, you have an equal chance to keep an 80 and it's not that difficult but it, it still kind of is 
for someone like me where I always fell in the writing sections of my dictations or like my quizzes and stuff and my tests so keep that in mind. Um, we had two dictations every week um, of the new vocabulary learned. We normally have to write, she'll say a sentence, we have to write it along with the tones and then also we have one test every week of the new chapter of the chapter we learn and then start the new chapter the same day. So this one, the program I felt like here um, is much more rigorous, much more strict, but more effective in terms of learning Chinese. Um, like I said, again, maybe my experience in China is very, it can vary where you go. My friend that went to BLCU, he said the programs there are really good, the teachers are really good. Because BLCU is actually the school in China where they create all the Chinese textbooks for the universities, for people studying and learning Chinese. So it makes sense why that school is really good to go. Um, and then I had two friends that went to Sichuan and I heard Sichuan is pretty good for learning Chinese as well. Um, so yeah, I would say if you're open into going to a smaller city, definitely check it out. I also met someone that studied in Hangzhou, and he said at Zhejiang University, um, he said that school is pretty good as well. So yeah, don't limit yourself to big cities, but if you do, I, I don't blame you, because if you don't live in the big cities, it could be a very drastic culture shock that I'm not sure everyone can handle. Now, we're gonna talk about student environment. Wow, now this one is big. And this really also depends where you go to school in both of these respective countries, but I think it is still drastically different. So, um, once again, if you're on scholarship in China, because you live on campus, it is so easy to meet people. Um, I'm, and also, it also depends on you. Like, I'm a pretty social person, so I, I'm, I love talking and meeting people. So I met a lot of people the first three months. Honestly, I felt like I met at least three people every week. Maybe even more than that. Through friends, and through my classes. The biggest way, the easiest way was like, um, I hung out in the lobby of the dorm a lot of the main building I met so many people there both great interesting weird and bad <laughs> but yeah it was great it was good it was good I, I wouldn't say all of them were my friends but people knew me ish like I got recommended um, when people need help for stuff and I don't mind helping people I love to help people so yeah and then also like hanging out um, outside um, I met a lot of people there um, yeah, it was really, really nice. It was, I loved it. And then people were from all over. So I, I didn't only not met people from like the U.S. Because I like to branch out as much as I like, like <laughs> to meet people from where I'm from. I love meeting people that come from different places. Like one of my closest friends was Hungarian. That was probably the first Hungarian I ever met when I lived in China. So that was really fun. And I had a lot of like Korean friends. I didn't grow up around a lot of Asian people, so like this was very new for me, and I loved it. It was awesome. Awesome. My friend group was so diverse. So diverse. We were from every and anywhere. I loved it. Um, and then in class itself was very diverse too. Oh, Thailand, Canada. I was the only person from the U.S. in my class. Um, Russia, Switzerland, Sweden. Um, and of course Japan, um, Korea, Thailand, I said Thailand, um, they're from everywhere, Laos, um, gosh, Norway, oh, people from everywhere, it was awesome, so easy to meet people because I lived on campus, so, 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 incredibly so easy, but then another thing is that you sometimes, because you're in that school and our international environment, you, it's easy to get stuck on that and only speak English or whatever language like there were a big group of French people and Canadian people from like this study abroad program 
and they were always together. I didn't even see them talk to other international students. Like they, it was like 20, 30 of them. Same for a group of Swedes, like Swedes. So yeah, it's really easy to get stuck on that and not improve your Chinese, but not to say you can't, but yeah, it's, it can be hard. So actually, I will be honest with you, when I went to China, I wasn't really there to like learn Chinese. I was there to get a new experience. And that is exactly what I got. I got what I needed out of it. I wasn't there to necessarily like, oh, I need to be fluent by the end of my year there. Like, no, that obviously didn't happen. But uh, I learned enough to get by. I can do a lot of things on my own. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was, at the end of the day, the program was well worth it for me. Everyone has a different goal when they go for these programs. It's not only necessary to learn Chinese. So keep that in mind, you know, everyone has something different going out for them. So now in terms of Taiwan, it is very different, very different. Not to say it's in a bad way because you don't live on campus. It's actually much, much harder to meet people um, here. And I will say that with quotation mark because like I said, I am a social person. So I still find ways to meet people just most of the time, if I meet people that attend school, then I don't meet them at school. I meet them like at the bar, in the park, even at the club. <laughs> I don't meet them at school because our classes only consist of max 10 people. And honestly, as much as the people in my class were cool, I mean, I didn't really hang out with any of them apart from going to class. So, you know, there was that, but luckily, um, I met a few people just by like hanging out and we have a main area on the seventh floor where the library and the classrooms are and I've met people there and then met other people through them so that works out and then because also I would say another thing that's different for me um, versus my time in China I came to Taiwan well before I started studying, started my program. I came in June, I started studying in September. So I met, I was traveling, met a lot of people um, in Taiwan itself. So I already had friends when I started school. I met much more, but yeah, it, it's very different. But I would say too, because we don't live on campus and maybe also, I think it also has to do how Taiwan, Taiwanese people are more open and they're much, much nicer and friendlier than Chinese people. I'm not, that's not a lie. That is not a lie. Um, it's easier to make friends with Taiwanese people. I feel like um, I've traveled a lot of places and I feel like a lot of times in China, um, and not only China, a lot of places I go to, when people come up and talk to me, is because they want to get something out from me or they want to scam me or steal something from me. And I'm not just saying that I'm being like, um, like I'm overthinking it, but a lot of times that was the case. So a lot of times it didn't feel genuine. So, and on top of that, a lot of Chinese people are pretty cold, but it's just how they grew up. So I can't blame them for it. <laughs> We're not necessarily cold. They just, they gone through a lot. And a lot of what has happened in China has been passed down to generation to generation. It is getting better, but it's nowhere near um, as where I would, where it makes foreigners comfortable. And not to say there weren't nice Chinese people when I went, but not enough <laughs> for me to make e friends easily with other Chinese people. Um, but in Taiwan, they're super open. They love to talk to people. I think also because I'm, my case is special because yeah a lot of people do travel to Taiwan but not a lot of black people so a lot of people come up to me often maybe also because of my hair a lot of people ask about my hair so yeah I get some really I've had actually um, really weird interactions <laughs> a lot of interesting fun but also weird interactions with locals here um, because of it I think um, but yeah, it's, 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 I've met a lot more people. I actually have more Taiwanese friends than I had Chinese friends in China. So I think it balances, not having to live on campus, it kind of balances itself out. So.
Okay, we're almost done. So student resources. So in terms of student resources in China, not a whole ton, but there's quite a bit. Like um, a lot of international still have access to the same things as the regular students do. Like there's tons of li there was at Fudan there was a libraries. Um, you can eat in the canteen. Um, there's the gyms you have access to. Lots of different facilities. Um, we didn't really necessarily have anything catered to us other than the lobby in the in the dorm, um, which even that's only limited to people who live on campus or like if your friend invites you. But yeah, it's still quite limited. Um, but a lot of these places, because Chinese universities are pretty big, they're pretty packed all day round. So try to go during off peak hours um but yeah it, it's there i didn't go to the library that much i never went to the gym i hate i hate the gym i like to exercise but i like to like dance or like bike or something that was my go-to so i did stuff like that while i was there so that was nice now in terms of taiwan i think it varies from school to school but um, actually, at NTNU, I love the facilities there. So we get an ID card, and in order to use any of the student um, facilities, you have to tap in with your ID card. Um, and it's nice because it keeps track of the time while you're in these places, so they're being counted towards your hours. But then also, you have to... Um, it's nice because it's just catered for the language students. So we have our own library, there's multiple computer labs, there's a big lecture hall that we have to go to. Um, so there's a lot of places where you can go study. And then on top of that, you could use a lot of school resources. Like you could go to the actual library um, to study. You can use the gym for very cheap, only 500 NT every two months, apparently. That's only like, less than 20 US dollars like come on that's cheap um, and it, I heard it's pretty good I haven't gone but it's good um, but yeah I think it's nice that the school provides all these amenities just catered towards us um, actually in China my friend that went to BLCU he told me that I think they had something similar and then actually for the textbooks they were given the textbook for free but in Fudan, we had to pay. It wasn't that expensive, but it, it still costs quite a bit. But yeah, it's really nice. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about is extracurriculars. So in China, um, every semester, I think like the second or third week of school, they do a big fair um, in the... Um, well, this is at Fudan, at the... Um, volleyball courts so i believe or basketball courts i can't remember um where they showcase all the clubs that you could join and it's both for foreign and chinese students um it can be quite intimidating especially if you don't know chinese because a lot of clubs are only really spoken in chinese so if you don't know chinese it's hard but not impossible to join um and then there's also a few but very few foreign run clubs that you could join the one that comes to mind gosh i can't remember the name but yeah it's it's nice there's a lot of opportunities and then there's a lot of events that goes on like in the beginning of the some the year in september through like december ish they have like what's called food on idol and food on got talent i don't know if they still do it but it was pretty fun so you can enter and showcase your talent to win money or that year they won someone a group won iphone 6s that's pretty nice pretty nice if you ask me but yeah stuff like that so yeah definitely check it out if you have some time um i didn't participate in the club so much i didn't really have an interest it intimidated me because i didn't really know chinese but also like yeah, I just wasn't that interested, so. But yeah, I would say definitely check it out. I did go to a lot of the, not a lot, but a few of the school events. Like if the school had like, I remember they were giving out mooncakes um, at the international dorm. So I would, I would do that. Or like if sometimes students would just come together and put together an event or something. Or if an event was going on downtown, I'd go to that. 
I didn't do many of those, but they're pretty nice. So yeah, definitely try and branch out and do something different. And it's for Taiwan. It varies, but at Shida, they actually showcase um, different clubs when we come for orientation. Um, and the clubs talk about what they do. And you can join the groups via line group chat. And yeah, and then they also have a bulletin board on the seventh, sixth, and seventh floors, but mainly the seventh floor, where they have all information of regarding clubs but also people advertising stuff so there's endless stuff you could do and then there's events going on in Taipei but I don't know too much I haven't actually gone to that many um, but I would say a lot of events are advertised on Facebook they're really big on advertising it on Facebook so um, you can check that out and then you can also join meetup um, if you want to be involved and do that and then actually the school itself also has a language exchange program, which I am a part of. Um, it's, I had to Google it. I think they put it on their website somewhere. But yeah, you could be part of, partnered up with a local student at NTNU and practice speaking Chinese with them. So yeah, that's nice. Or you could advertise it for yourself. So definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, it's pretty good, honestly. I haven't joined any of the actual club clubs and telling you but they look good just due to my schedule at the moment but yeah I would definitely check that out and then also not really extracurricular but you could take some supplementary classes at um, NTNU um, where they're more culture based so they have options of taking cooking class calligraphy poetry um, um, I can't remember there's some other classes that they offer um, it's not included the tuition you pay you have to pay additional 5,000 and then sometimes even more depending if you have to buy materials for that class um, but I personally don't know anyone that's taking those classes but they look really good I might have to take it one semester I don't know we'll see well this ends the video I really hope this um, gives you a good idea how it's like studying Chinese in both China and Taiwan Maybe this will help you decide which program is better for you or maybe you're just interested in learning more about it Either way, I feel like I forgot a few things. So now if you have any questions Just put it down in my com in the comment section. I'll get right back to you. Also check out I wrote um, information about what I'm talking about here on my blog so check out the links all in the description box as well. Um, and yeah, I really hope this was helpful to you. So yeah, see ya.